I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. To Dr. Christine King. All right. I'd like you to start by closing your eyes. And imagine you're in grade 10. You're just passing most of your subjects. Assessment's increasing and it's harder to handle. And pressure is piling up. What will you be when you leave school? Subject choices, before and after school support groups, parent expectations, hopes, parent dreams, and parent threats. Homework is every night and for hours, setting you up for a pattern into adulthood. So open your eyes, and how do you feel? What are you learning at school? This is not an imaginary story. It's a story of Sarah that I'll tell you about soon, but it might also be your story. And it's the story of thousands of students in Australia and millions of students worldwide. And it's also the story for some children who are only five. Now, my question is this. What if students were learning about learning rather than learning about things? Or learning how to learn rather than what to learn? What if they had a subject called learning? because that's what schools are about, isn't it? Or a subject called education, so that they knew about the system they were learning in. Why do parents pay tutors to teach their child what they're already paying a school to teach their child? It's estimated that in Australia, 25% of students are actually getting some form of tuition or academic support. Aren't they busy enough? I grew a deeper interest in learning because of a potato. Well, it wasn't actually a potato, but it was a group of potato farmers. And when I started my career in the mid-90s, I, I worked as an agricultural extension officer, working with farmers to understand and improve their farming practices. And one night, I was in North Queensland with a colleague, Jim. And Jim had been working with this group for 18 months, working with them with this sort of very systemic... Uh, learning reflective process called action research. And I asked Jim in the meeting, have you actually talked to the group of farmers about this process? And he said, no, no, I just do it. And I said, oh, do you mind if I you know, ask them about it? And he said, no, no, you do it. And what happened next made me realize the power of understanding and reflecting on your own learning. So as I drew this action research process up on the whiteboard, I could hear these little aha moments. Um, before I even started to explain the process, the farmers were saying, yeah, that's what Jim does. And then one farmer said jokingly, we don't need you now, Jim. <laughs> we don't need you. You know, we can just follow this. And Jim laughed back and said, don't tell the boss. And when we then discussed, you know, this action research process and what they'd done over the last 18 months. And the farmer said that if Jim had actually introduced this process 18 months ago when they first started and he started rambling on about learning, they would have run a mile and never come back to a second meeting. But they also said that if Jim had have introduced the action research process six months earlier, they believed that they would have more control over their learning and they'd be further down the track than what they were now with Jim's facilitation. And the discussion ended with the group asking, why didn't we learn about learning sooner? This pattern repeated itself when I worked with younger and younger groups as I got older. And in 2000, I took on a state role where I was responsible for capacity building of extension staff. And they asked the same thing when I worked with them. Why didn't we learn this at uni? I then worked with postgraduate students to help them facilitate learning in these large um, multi-stakeholder projects. And they were in health and poverty alleviation, food security. And they asked me, why didn't we learn about learning in our undergrad? Then as a lecturer at university, I started teaching students about learning. And I noticed something really interesting, that they started to improve their grades in all of their subjects and not just mine. And if I think about the work that I've done, not just with students, but in a career and trying to help people and groups and communities and organizations reflect on their own learning, learning to learn is what enables this extraordinary systemic change and transformation. And discovery learning in this is key. If a person discovers, you know, the benefit of something for themselves, they're more likely to make a change. You know, if we tell someone to change, we all know what happens, don't we? <laughs> they look like they're listening, and they nod their heads, and then they don't make a change. 
Anyway, I ended up leaving my position at the university to bring up my three beautiful children. And uh, fast forward a few years, and my eldest child started school. And this question had been in the back of my mind, like, why didn't we learn about learning sooner? So it became this really big, loud voice, because now I was a parent. And education meant something quite different to me, and I wondered, you know, why didn't we learn about learning sooner? So in 2014, I put together this program, and I called it Learn to Learn and Get Better Grades. And I, you know, advertised it, and I advertised it um, saying that I wasn't going to tutor your child in maths or physics or chemistry, although I'd done that before, but I advertised it saying, I'll teach your child how to learn about learning so that they can apply that across all of their subjects. Now, one, stu one, one student I had, Sarah, uh, contacted me on her own, and I'll never forget the first phone call because Sarah was crying. And she said, if I don't improve my grades, mum's kicking me out of home. And it was, it was quite dramatic, and I listened to her for the next 10 minutes. And I said, you know, I was thinking about it, and I thought, I don't think the problem's with Sarah. I actually think it's with her mum. <laughs> so Sarah was 17 and in grade 10, and she'd been moved from school to school. And Sarah's mum could only see that she wasn't passing and she could only see her grades, and she, couldn't, she could only see that her, her daughter wasn't, you know, going well in a classroom. I had Sarah and her mum do a learning styles questionnaire together and Sarah's mum got, you know, fairly average across all the different learning styles and Sarah got the most extreme score I'd ever seen in 15 years of using the tool as an activist learner. And, you know, I, I explained the results to Sarah and her mum at the table and Sarah's mum got teary and she leant over and apologised to her daughter. And uh, I worked with Sarah for the next three months she ended up quitting school, but not in a bad way. She quit school at the end of first term. She went and did a bridging program for year 11 and 12, and she was at uni by the time she was 18. I had another serendipitous learning. I was coaching Jimmy, and, and uh, Jimmy and I used to work in the room next to the kitchen, and Jimmy's mum was in the kitchen. She used to listen in to, to what we were doing, making sure I was coaching properly. And... Uh, one day she came in because I was talking to Jimmy and I was uh, saying to him, um, you know, here's this, we were working through his personality type and saying, you know, how does your personality type influence your, your learning? And after I ended up having the, uh, that lesson with, with him, his mum came in and said, do you mind if I do it too? Can I do it? And I said, yeah, sure, sit down. Anyway, I ended up having his mum come to that, those sessions and listening in. And I had my last session with him and he was just about to do exams and I actually asked his mum, you know, what do you think the benefits of my coaching have been? And she said something that was totally what I never set out to do and really surprised me. And she said, you've provided uh, Jimmy and I with a common language to talk about his day and his learning. And when he gets home from school, we can problem solve together about what he's doing. And this has provided us with a language that we can use and he can use for the rest of our lives. And I've got so many other stories about these extraordinary and resilient students, but I want to sum up uh, four things that I've learned working with these students. And the first one is, you know, the main reasons that students don't do, you know, as well as they think and they, their grades don't actually reflect their actual capacity doesn't really have to do with their knowledge of course content, <laughs> and probably many of you know that, but it has to do with, you know, lots of other things that influence their learning. So things like their confidence, their self-esteem, their personality type, and, you know, their relationships, what's happening with their friends, what's happening with their family, and, you know, how their teacher teaches, uh, how they manage their stress, how they manage their time, and also how they understand and manage their learning. I've also concluded that uh, most students can be, or any student can be an A-grade student. So this difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset I think is very real. I could bring C-grade students to A-grade students in six to eight weeks, but I also could work with A-grade students and help them just reduce their stress, re reduce anxiety. The third one is procrastination and lack of motivation. Now, these two things is the most common complaint I get from parents when they contact me about their child. But 
procrastination and lack of motivation aren't the causes of poor grades. They're actually a response to stress and overwhelm because of the environment that the student's in. And then the fourth one, creating a common language about learning between a parent and child, I think, from my experience now, is probably one of the most powerful support mechanisms you can put in place as a parent uh, with your child when they're at school. So what was I doing in my program? You know, I was essentially using these different learning theories and concepts and models and frameworks and taking them and just using them as tools with the student so that they were actually aware of the learning that they were doing and looking at it. And if I just give you an example, you know, we might look, take something like the learning cycle and we'd look at the different parts of the cycle and we'd look at, you know, their learning style, but we're not going to focus on that. We're actually going to focus on the other parts of the learning cycle that they're not so strong in and actually try and uh, optimise the whole process. And then we look at the, you know, the parts around that, everything in their environment that influences the learning cycle and say, well, how can we manage these and how do they impact on the different parts of the learning process? So if we go back to this question, what if students were learning about learning rather than learning about things, there's a little bit of a twist here. And the best way I can explain this is by this old saying, and you've all heard it, give a person a fish and you feed them for a day, teach them how to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to burst the bubble, burst your bubble here. But what if your fishing industry collapses? Now, I think we've seen, uh, especially in the last year of systems and industries collapsing. Um, so learning how to fish isn't going to help you. But if you learn the process of how you learn to fish, you can apply that in any context, in any situation. But in order to learn how to learn, you need to reflect on how you learnt the what. So it was a trick question because you actually need to do both. But the purpose of learning the what becomes part of a process and it's not the end goal. And the what has this potential to change. The end goal is learning about learning and learning in order to adapt and transform no matter what arises. So I'm going to end this um, with a, a bit of a story about someone that I went to um, university with. And it demonstrates to me the importance of learning about learning and learning to learn in our education systems. So a, a friend of mine, she, I was at uni with her and she was quite bright and she did extremely well on assignments. She used to help others in the class. But every time she sat an exam, she either failed or just passed. After a while, she lost her confidence. She, you know, she became anxious before exams and, and you know, then she did worse. And she really got through her bachelor degree just because her assignments pushed her, you know, over the line. And she went through these times of self-doubt and sometimes self-hate because of her struggles with learning. But she still persevered. She ended up actually going on and doing a PhD. Now, later in life, I contacted her because I found out about this visual processing disorder called Erlen syndrome that my partner had. And it's this problem, you know, with the brain's ability to process visual it, uh, visual information, it's, it's estimated that 14% of the population have this. When I talk to people, no one's heard of it. And now people have Erlen syndrome, that they have this sensitivity to light and they have difficulty reading. And their brain can sort of become overwhelmed um, when exposed to certain wavelengths of light as well and it causes these visual distortions. So, you know, words can blend. Sometimes words actually appear higher than the page. And under fluorescent light, they can actually get headaches, get nausea, and they actually feel motion sick. You can imagine having that every time you <laughs> read a book or went to read something. Imagine how that would impact on your learning. The things I saw my partner doing to adjust to Erlen syndrome were similar to what I saw my friend do. Photocopying notes on coloured paper and having to read paragraphs two or three times when we only read them once. And, uh, you know, reading in low light as well. So she had to develop these whole, you know, all this, these other strategies to, to deal with learning. And I rang her and told her about Erlen syndrome and she got tested and later she was officially diagnosed. And she went and got herself these, you know, a pair of glasses and all I had was a set of these lenses specifically for Erlen syndrome. So it was a very quick fix. And uh, it, then she, for fun, went off and did another degree. While she was working full time, and she got the highest GPA 
for the whole degree of 350 students. Anyone can be an A-grade student. So I often wonder why no one realised that she had Erlen syndrome, either at school or at uni. Why were teachers, you know, were her teachers sort of too focused on subjects and competencies and grades rather than how she was learning? How much easier would her life have been if she got her glasses sooner? You know, what if she learnt about learning at school? Would she have picked this up herself? And I also wonder, would she be so passionate about learning now? Or would she be just as resilient? So if you haven't guessed already, the friend I was actually talking about is me. So I want to finish with two questions. And the first question is, what if you learnt about learning at school? Have a think about that. What if you actually learnt about learning at school? And then should students learn to learn at school too? Thank you.